Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have a guest that needs no introduction, Bill Brown. A A A A A. William Padilla Brown, <laughs> as he's known, Myco Symbiote. William, nice to have you on the Mushroom Hour. Man, I'm happy to be here. This is great. Yeah, well, you're you are christening our new recording studio. We're at Petaluma Community Access. Couldn't ask for a better first guest. Feels about right. Feels about right. Yeah. Well, that's actually where I want to start. Uh, Cause you're out here, we're live, we're in person, and in you are flesh. in California. Yeah. Tell what brought you out here. I mean, why? What are you doing in California? Right on. So I'm out here for a lot of reasons. I'm working. I'm living with my family, enjoying life. The past week has been interesting. We got we landed in California on Wednesday, the second or first of November, and then on Thursday, we went to go attend a screening of a documentary I was featured in uh, called uh, Method Sampling. Um, so a buddy of mine that uh, I've worked with on some uh, video projects back in uh, Pennsylvania, um, he's just been moving on up through the uh, multimedia industry. And uh, he ended up working with this uh, crew that was filming a documentary um, around this hip hop orchestra, um, around this idea of uh, sampling different elements of various um, systems to create something new. Um, and so they wanted to highlight different people. And um, through my buddy that, that uh, helped to produce it from Pennsylvania, they tapped me in and were like, how did you figure out from all, all these little bits around the world how to like grow cordyceps the way that you grow cordyceps when there wasn't anybody doing it before? So um, they wanted you for the mushroom, the ecology. I was thinking, like a symbiote, the rapper, it's cosmic <laughs> music, but no, they wanted you for yeah the mushroom yeah. work. Yeah, it was like it, it, they put. It was like a you know, it's a really interesting fit. It's like the black mycologist, the the kid that figured out how to like grow the mushroom that nobody was growing. Um, they also featured a disabled uh, uh, choreographer, so uh, he was a dancer, ballet dancer, and got into a car accident and figured out how to you know do choreography from the wheelchair and teaches people how to dance and do different movements and things like this. And then there was a gentleman that was uh, trained in building boats that is now building tiny homes with like these like nuanced elements and things like that and then the hip-hop orchestra you know they're sampling different elements from different types of of music to create something new um so that was the mo and it's just like you know how do we build a a better future together out of what we have here yeah Um, well that highlights one of the things that i think i've noticed about you recently is you're kind of doing a lot of different things you know, you haven't just settled in, this is going to be my lane, I'm the genetic sequencing guy, I'm the cordyceps guy, but you're kind of broadening out into wider culture. Now, is that kind of a conscious choice? Is it just sort of happening because this stuff's getting popular? Well, I mean, anybody, like, at this point, I've been, like, actively putting myself to the public for a little over 10 years. And anybody that saw any of my content or anybody that's taken themselves back through my content before mycosymbiote, before mycosymbiotics, I was doing a lot of different things. I was always doing a bunch of different things. It was in 2014, around the time my son was born, that I started to take things a little bit more serious. And looking at the analytics on the internet, I could see that all of my mushroom content was clearly outmatching everything else I was putting on the internet. It just made sense. It was the yeah. it was the thing that the world was interested in. Why would I go kicking rocks, put in about vegan recipes whenever it wasn't the time for that yet? Or when it, why would I go talking about algae? It wasn't the time for that yet. Or rewilding, it wasn't the time for that. But mushrooms were hot. It was the time to get into it. And I was interested in it. But like my background and the only thing that I have like a certificate for, a certification for is permaculture design, which is a whole system design science. And my role in the system that I'm building is to be able to educate and provide models and examples of ecologically regenerative industries for those that are ready to build up into those nuanced spaces. So like I have cordyceps growers that all they care about is growing cordyceps. They grow my cordyceps for me. I have people that's interested in just doing the culture work. I have people that's interested in just doing the DNA work. And so I'm building people up to be able to like fill these spaces because all of these in their own have the potential to be a business even if they're not working directly through me, through our community, 
through the outreach that we've done through MycoFest, through our classes, um, you know, I've been able to illuminate fields of interest uh, for people that they just didn't notice before, they didn't see before. Well, and that's what's so interesting is you've made it really tangible, right? So a lot of times we talk about ecological design, regenerative sciences, and a lot of it ends up being going to camps, going to retreats, getting stoked about it, which I do. Like, I love seeing it. I love to see people doing it. Then you just think, how do they make money? And I've interviewed some people that have done, like, bioremediation, and they couldn't keep doing it because it just wasn't feasible. Yeah. So that's what's so interesting to me is you're trying to build up a sustainable economic kind of network Mm -hmm. of these suppliers that, I mean, is that what's going on is these suppliers that are supporting each other and make this something that this is like a real industry. This is not just for the hype of it or Mm -hmm. for, because it sounds good, but this actually produces. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could like, uh, in my meditations before I started all of this, like I took myself very, very deep and like removed myself almost entirely from social and cultural norms and allowed myself to be what people called crazy some of those old pictures you were an astral buddha straight up like you you were a spirit being (laughs) i didn't mind that the way that people viewed me because the perspective i had i understood you know i understood and i could i could draw value from it that was able to benefit me in my life and throughout my career i've been able to provide value in other people's lives that came from those same experiences and in in those experiences, I I had you know a lot of deep lesson, lessons that led me towards building this way, and and it is in, it's intentional, and we're and we're making opportunity for more people uh, to be able to engage with this, um, which makes more opportunity for us to do the work that I find to be the most valuable, which is oftentimes not the work that pays. When I was younger, um, and I got into permaculture, I saw some of wh- what I believe to be some of the most brilliant people I have ever met and I wanted them to be able to go do bioremediation and I wanted them to be able to go study the environment because I knew that that was the most important thing that anybody could be doing and I'm like how come we can't get money for this how come we're not paid we're literally the most wealthy people like all all wealth all value comes from nature and we know how to actually interact with it more than anybody else in the world so how come we're stuck in the ends so my whole my whole career I'm just like I saw a lot of people when I was younger also protesting and getting getting frustrated and emotional and wanting some somebody or some entity or some power to change the situation. Right. And I looked at this I looked at the situation. I lived with my mom as a diplomat across the world. I saw the people in power. I saw how power structures work. I saw how governing bodies work. And in the US, you know, wealthy people pay politicians they lobby their politicians the politicians you know do the work for the different corporations to make sure that the laws are savvy for those individuals this is just real life so like That's why wouldn't i do are, it yeah. too you know what i'm saying yeah. so like everybody was getting mad at it and i'm saying like well we, we can go get that money too and we can get our own politicians and we can do all of that <laughs> ourselves i tried to run for mayor when i was like you know 21 people think that these things are all like kitschy but it's like part of the story it's part of like providing those examples and those models to be able to say hey i did it it's not something that's impossible. We can do this too. And it's not just for show because there is a, a, a bigger, grander scheme of being the alchemist of the moment and taking the elements of what we have in our reality to create something new because we can't just... I, I would love for it to just be one day where everybody's forced into just having to go back into the nature and we can... I know we can figure it out. Right. But there's so many people that will be that that would be their cutoff. There's so many people that would not make it past that. Right. So with with being mindful of being as helpful to as many people as possible or being or making this 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 next steps uh, available to as many people as possible that want to get engaged with it is like making it digestible. Like we like you have to, you know, show people a political system that's familiar enough but different in the ways that we need it to be different. Show people an economic system that's familiar enough but different in the ways that we need it to be different because if it's too different then people are not going to even want to interact with it. You right. know, it's going to be foreign. It's going to be alien. So like what that's, and that's part of what we're doing. You know, I, there was a point in my, in my life during that time of meditation where I rejected it all. And then that, at that point I was unrelatable. Yes. I've been <clears> that person. And now I'm in a position where I'm getting put on all these stages because people can relate to what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's part of that being the alchemist of the moment and taking what's relatable 
taking these different elements, making it digestible and changing it enough that it starts to become ecologically regenerative instead of antibiotic. And that's really like the MO at the end of it. I love that idea of putting it on the antibiotic versus the ecologically regenerative and thinking Mm -hmm. things in that context. And that's what sticks out to me. We're talking about this. It's a language. Mm -hmm. You have to familiarize people with the language of these concepts and what we're even talking about before, you know, you can't just cut it off and like stop the system as it is today and expect something to come out of that. Like this is a living, it's kind of an organism. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to transform it or I I love talking about alchemy, like, yeah, if we're going to do some change that then inevitably changes that system, right? We are changed by it, but we can also change it. Mm -hmm. Uh, That work is huge. And maybe, maybe that's a point of frustration. I know it is for myself and other people. It's just, when is it going to happen? When is it going to be, we wake up, and we're living in a pastoral society. We're all wearing white in a field and we're doing regenerative things. And this is just the way of being. Well, but- I, I think I think that um, the singularity happens for different individuals at different points in time. I think that there's a lot of people that are already there. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of people that's on their way there. Yeah. But I also think that there has to be more people that's ready to be uncomfortable because because that's what that means. Like, yeah. like the reality that we are transitioning into is a reality of un unstability. Like the, it, it, we don't have that same predictability and schedule and, and it's, it's chaotic in the way that our society is, is, is operating. Chaos seems like it's a bad thing, but that's the state of, of the natural world. Yes. And so as beings that are, are, are subjected to it, you have to be prepared to be riding the waves of, of reality. Like I can't depend quarterly that the sh- that the morels and the shanarels and the matsutaki and the maitaki are going to be there that quarter for me to go get that and there's people that has to they have to make their and they have to get this quota and da 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 but like people look at my life through the internet and they think i'm rich and they think i've had all i, I i've had probably one of the most rich lives in my mind of anybody but to be able to have these experiences i have had no like uh, dependable income for over 10 years. I've, I, for 10 years, I have to be at the will of nature providing me with my, with what I need. And that's random that somebody hits me up to go do a class or that the, the morels are there when I need them to be, or that the maitake is there when I need it to be. But I live my life in faith and I live my life in prayer and I live my life in purpose. And, yeah. and that's my philosophy. So I know that by following my purpose, that I'll always be where I need to be, when I need to be there, and I'll always be provided with whatever I need to be provided with. And that's how I ended up here. And that's how I ended up everywhere. And a lot of people have a hard time swallowing that. But you know, Kalindi said one of my favorite quotes. He says, if I throw a rock into a pack of wolves, the only one that yells is gonna be the one that gets hit. So the people that have the problems with what I say, or people that have qualms with anything in the world, you're the one that's having an issue with this thing. It may be something that you need to deal with within yourself because you know i believe in a higher power and that makes my life possible and i know that makes my life possible because when i was a little boy i looked at my mom and my mom is is christian my mom had had adopted two children in mexico my stepfather was not very helpful he was abusive to to me and and, uh, and my brothers and sisters and uh she worked and took care of all of us. And I know how hard that is. I know how hard that is with just, my, with just my two children. And at the end of the day, I would see her get on her knees and pray and that everything will be okay for her. And I would say, how does this work? And she's like, God what is going to take care of this, you know? And like, whatever it was for me, because I don't, I don't believe the same way she believes. I don't follow the religion like she does. But whatever it was that she had in her prayer was able to help her to do things that I thought was going to be impossible. So I was like, there's something there that I want to cultivate within myself. And I have, and I, and I value it more than anything else. It, it's will, it's <clears throat> intention, it's the natural world. Those are all the fundamental ingredients to doing anything on this planet, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when you talk about that, some of those belief systems, some of the way you move in the world, that's what people have been doing before we had money, before we, this is how people derive meaning and move forward in their life. So the fact that the systems that other humans have made that we live by now kind of coalesce and align as you still move in that direction. 
makes sense. It's nothing. It's not magical thinking. It's not, it's an application of will and also a tremendous amount of courage. You know, that's some, one thing that I'm always impressed by people that have that level of faith to be, I'm right where I need to be. I try to do that more. Mm-hmm. You know, I like a lot of my life, I live in the mundane. So I live in like taxes and business. And so I try to open myself up more to like, all right, I don't need to push as much to make stuff happen. I don't need to, I just need to keep applying myself, keep applying my will, keep applying my intention in a positive direction. And some of these other pieces will fall into place. And it's corny, but like the more I do that, the more stuff lines up and it yep. opens up. And I think so many people now realize that in any of these arenas, like the more you do that, the more every, the universe conspires to support you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so, honestly like, when I was younger, I studied a lot of metaphysics, both like in in my practices, and yeah. I also studied a lot of physics. And there's a lot of similarities. There's a really great book that I've been quoting in like all of my uh, interviews, uh, "Mind Dynamics in Space and Time" by Elizabeth Rauscher uh, and doctors uh, JJ and uh, Desiree Hertog. And this book it really puts into perspective, you know, how like the conscious mind operates through and interacts with you know the physical reality and you know there's a there's a lot of aspects of this to it it's like you know one the great bob marley said it emancipate yourself from mental slavery none but ourselves can free our mind you know what i mean so like uh check your your actions every day you know yeah. check your routines every day and see how many of your routines are making rich people richer and how many of your routines are actually putting energy into your own pot and there's so much of that that's there are simple things you can do that we all can do if you get okay with being a little uncomfortable, like mm-hmm. you were saying, if you're okay with not everything being totally secure, totally predictable, then you can make some choices. You know, like the the small one that I think everybody wrestles with is like, where you buy stuff from, right? Do you order from Amazon? Like, where are you choosing to make that tiny decision? Mm-hmm. And it's always insane to me how much myself and other people, you can't even make that much of a sacrifice. Like, no, I need this level of convenience. Mm-hmm. Whereas even if you're making decisions like that, start with that, that has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. So yeah, much less other decisions about your life and how you choose to, you know, let, again, let the universe kind of align around you. Yeah. And like for 10 years now, I've also been very, very focused on like slowing down. I've also been Mm -hmm. very focused on looking into the woods, looking into nature, looking into the, the uh, waterways and listening and seeing what they have to tell me. And in those 10 years, so many other people have spent those hours consuming content and I've been in the woods, reading books, going on hikes, you know, interacting with people around the US. And like, I started to notice more recently, the level of patience I've cultivated in Mm -hmm. a time of high anxiety. I can take my time with things. And and I think that that's like something that a lot of people have a hard time with. A lot of people don't finish things before they start other things. I've done that so many times. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I like every day, like I'm literally like, Will, take your house shoes off bef- and your sandals off and put your <laughs> boots on before you walk outside. I know you want to go get that firewood, but like, like take your time. There's no, there's no rush. Right. Like you're going to, you're going to bring your dirty shoes take back into the, the house. Slides like, off and put the boots on. That's you know what I mean? Just yeah. little things, like yeah. little things. And like, it's like those things turn into like, you know, more discipline within yourself, more tact within yourself because especially in the United States of America, we are being bombarded with pleasure overload. Like people are are, desensitized. Yeah. Yeah. People are desensitizing us because they're literally selling us the things that we're most susceptible to interacting with. And it, and it, and it puts a lot of people in a position of like being highly distracted on a day to day basis. And I don't really think that's conducive of like any kind of, you know, self-development or, you know, anything like this. So like, and slowing down, it's funny, slowing down, it's funny you said that, because I've been trying to do that recently, even in talking with people, engaging with people in space. Like when you first got here today, I was like jumping out of my skin. <laughs> I was like, he's here. You know, so it's like slowing down, it also has this thing where it makes you feel almost more confident. It makes you feel more present. Mm-hmm. Remember to breathe. Like, yes. dude, this is basic. Yes. But it is insane how... I've read all the spiritual books. I've read the Be Here Now. I've read the Eckhart Tolle. I've read the Eating the Eye, like all the books. Mm -hmm. And still, I have to remind myself, like, stop and breathe. Mm -hmm. Like, be present. Slow down a little bit. Man, that is, 
so basic, so powerful. We can all work on that. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of really great wisdoms to draw from the old teachings. Yeah. And like a lot of those teachings are not even old, really. Right. But um, there's this perspective. I, I, I would be tripping or, or have, I'd be having my meditations or whatever. And I would have these experiences where I would feel like this reality was about to have an upgrade and that the old ways of interacting with ourselves are not going to be as relative anymore. Like the old languages that were developed by the Vedas or the old uh, yogis that stood on the mountains and or the Aramaic, the Egyptian, the Hebrew, the Tibetan, all of these languages that were used for not only like mystical understanding, but like deep understanding of self. Like a lot of these things were developed around, you know, how vibrations affect our mind and things like this, which we know and understand better now with like binaural beats and how different frequencies can change our brainwave states. These are things that humans figured out sitting around in a cave yelling at themselves for long <laughs> enough, you know? So like, yeah. But the thing I started to think, I'm like, since around the 1900s, eras have been shrunk down into tens years and like and moving into the 2000s, it's like, you know, we can go through er like trends that are that heavy within multiple times in a month. I was going to say like, it's days now. Yeah, yeah it like, feels like it. New trends, new cultures are emerging regularly. Like eras used to last hundreds of years. Then they went to lasting to the 20s, the 30s, the 70s, and you know, and like into the 2000s, like you could be born in the 2000s, early 2000s or 90s and be completely unrelatable to any human that has ever existed before because you don't make the fire and you don't go get the food and you don't, you don't, how do you, yeah. we've been effectively detached from what it means to be a human being in like two generations. Right. And so like, that's heavy. What does that like, do to us? Um, we're yeah. watching it right now. There's a lot of people that are on artificial substances to be able to maintain some level of sanity as they walk around in reality. Right. Yeah. And it's like, and that further reinforces the hyper reality, the it further, it further agitates and pushes into that, into that, the hyper reality state. Like, yeah, the, it, fe it feeds whatever we're doing now mm -hmm. gets fed by more. It makes people more anxious all over the place needing, needing a way to cope because we can't cope with the speed, the speed that we're getting our perceptions blasted, the speed. I always think of it that we as humans, our attention, our emotions are kind of at this point getting harvested. It's the last frontier of mon oh. commodification. Attention like, is, the, is the currency of the modern age. 100%. And so as that gets sucked out of us, we like don't know what to do. We don't have any coping mechanisms. So we resort more and more to those, like whether it's substances or whatever, addiction, and then that feeds mm -hmm. that system. Yeah, and people it feels don't even a like a spiral. Like... like the newest, like the more recent generation of, of hip hop artists were heavily influenced by artists like Lil Wayne. Yeah. And I don't think that a lot of people took in the understanding the way that he sounded in his music was highly influenced by what his lifestyle choices were. Right. Like he didn't just sound like that because he was trying to sound like that. He sounded yeah. like that because of his lifestyle choices were, you know, he's trying to even get his words into the microphone. And so like, there's a lot of artists that emulated that. So that's like a second level of it. And now we're, yeah. we're walking around a reality where successful people are utilizing, you know, all sorts of things that makes their them be more awake and more faster. And, right. and like whenever I do any business meetings with people from New York or L.A., like it's like. How do I like they, re they respond to email right away and they're like blah, blah, like everything I'm just like so guys I'm not on Adderall yeah I'm bro I'm like <laughs> yeah. I'm just like and like I've had to tell people more especially this year like this year I I one for first of all I don't interact with people that I don't want to interact with or that is like not like I don't really even do anything that I don't want to do anymore so it's like I I understand that luxury and I do you know. I think that's important for more people to do. That's a simple choice. A lot, a lot of people can make, and they don't even realize they can make. You can just walk you away can, from stuff you don't want to be yeah. involved with. <laughs> like, you can, you can, you can not have certain people in your life you don't want to. You can not do certain things if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. But you, you got to get a little uncomfortable sometimes. Yep. So I've been telling people because I'm, I'm not, I'm late to stuff a lot. Like I was even late today. I don't <laughs> live on a nine to five schedule. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's multiple times a week where I have to hone into a nine to five schedule. Yeah. But I live on the clock of the universe. I wake up when I wake up. I go to sleep when I go to sleep. 
I go outside when the mushrooms are there that, that I want to pick. I go outside when the plants are there that I want to pick. I go inside when I need to study them. I literally eat when I'm hungry. I, like, people's, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Like, I'm 9 to 5. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they, like conf- they've like conformed themselves into things that, like, it's hard to even deal with. Like, right. And, and I've had to tell some certain people... I appreciate you being able to interact with me not being of polite society. I'm not of, I'm 10 years removed from it. You know what I mean? No, but that's an interesting thing because I talked with Robin Harford in the UK and he was the one that, I mean, I've thought about this before. We've all thought about it, but you get trapped in even a system like time. Like he was talking about a South Pacific uh, group of like Islanders that mostly live on boats and they don't, and I, I can't even understand that they don't have a conception of time Mm -hmm. so they don't they don't have and i'm like well how what do you mean it's a linear thing like you get older he's like they don't have a thing called time Mm -hmm. so they just navigate yeah like the stars and moons change Mm -hmm. but it's like a cyclical thing and they're not tracking it yeah they're not they just are able to assess what you were saying before they're able to assess observe interpret what the natural signals are around them and that's their guiding compass a hundred percent which is like you're you're on that. Yeah. You're on the like the human being being <laughs> human. human. Being human. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're you're on the being human. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 so funny to me because like to me it feels like it feels simple. Like I was 16 years old, you know, 15, 16 years old deciding that I wanted to skip, skip school and try other things and like at that point in my life I was like why would I want to do any of this? Like, I yeah. just want to go in the woods and like eat whenever I'm hungry. Like, and like, well, and to think you that, know? you know, these structures that we think are like the pillars upholding what we are as a civilization. It's like education is very modern on that huge time scale You were talking about that way we do education is like the last, whatever minute. If human history was right, 24 like, hours, there's like, it's been like a minute. There's like a certain so, so, generations of PhDs from the first PhD because a PhD has to make another PhD since like the f- original university in like the Middle East. Yeah. It's not even that long. We can trace all of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, so it's like this and more and more as it, so many people have been on this journey, I'm sure that are listening, but more and more you kind of scale back like that. You get that almost like a deep time perspective, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. You start to think about, all right, well, what is quintessential to being a functional quote unquote successful healthy human on this planet. Mm-hmm. Well, it probably has nothing to do with that stuff. It all is nothing to do with other what other humans made. Mm-hmm. Right? Like some guy, yeah, some people invented this. We don't even know it's the best way. Now, increasingly I've thought about, well, there is this process where, you know, we've done, we tried so many different things throughout human history. The systems we have are kind of an output of these seemed to work. These seemed to provide an output we wanted. Mm-hmm. So we committed to it. But it isn't a core part of how we have to be on this planet. And it might, it might not be the right way. Yeah. I mean, I call it, and I, I treasure like, people that can live not on that wavelength. Like I said, I've kind of come into, uh, there was a point in my life where I was kind of there, but I couldn't translate it down to interacting with other people well enough mm-hmm. to function well enough. And I think yeah. you were probably there at one point and then there's you, been a lot of ups and downs. Yeah. And, well, and then, and then you, you learn the language well enough to like, all right, I have to be able to interact in that world to get resource. Cause that's how a majority of resources like gated off right now, whether that's mm-hmm. resource of like people, intellect or physical resources. Yep. It's in that. It's like system. a figurative desert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you have to be able to like speak their language to engage with that system enough to be able to still survive and do something else. So, but I always treasure people that have this perspective. Like I said, I'm sure so many listeners have this perspective, but yeah. Yeah. But to I see mean, people have translated like you have is there's a lot of people that's like, there's a lot of people that I've interacted with over the years that said that tell me I've been able to verbalize things that they feel or think about. Yeah. And they didn't know how to say it. I think that that's just part of like what my family does. Like my grandfather was the English professor. My grandfather was the first African-American English professor in New York city at Medgar Evers university. Like, he helped a lot of people like us as black men, as black people in the U.S. to be able to speak whenever we were out here, not even knowing what the people were saying to us and not knowing the language where we came from either. So that is like part of what we do as 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 Brown, like as the family, you know, that's the legacy of the Browns mm-hmm. is being translators. 
straight up translators of people who aren't already that's what my mom system. does my mom knows mandarin my mom knows i don't even know what language she speaks she works in in dubai right now and uh she oh. knows um spanish also and that's why i traveled my mom my mom manages f- foreign trade families in different regions of the world um that's for wild. the department of agriculture yeah yeah so she's been a translator in so many ways also so it's like there's certain uh, i feel like you can get really caught up in a world and like lose track of who you are and like a lot of us are displaced from our families or from our cultures and things like this so it can become a little bit confusing but like it's encoded in us so it's not too hard to figure it out if you can just really allow yourself to like the things that you like and not like the things that you don't like and just really sit with yourself and think about is this is this culture or society telling me that I should or shouldn't like these things or do I really like this thing and not like this thing because like that's one of the biggest ways that you can navigate reality down to foods down to the people you're interacting with down to the environments that you put yourself in and everything um, so if you've really been that displaced like you really just got to tap into like your senses and where they're guiding you because that's really who you are at the end of the day well and what I love about your example there is those threads of whatever your gift is those threads have probably shown up even if you have been mostly operating in kind of the dominant society structure that we have. Mm -hmm. There are probably those gifts, if you're a translator, if you're a writer, if you're a singer, that is shown up somewhere. Mm -hmm. It might not be, you know, you might not be on this totally kind of where you want to be and you feel trapped, but you've still been able to share and and hone those gifts. So there's still so much you can take from that. And that gets back to this idea of there is a transition possible. Mm -hmm. Like you still accumulated the skills, the knowledge, the relationships that you can use to slowly choose that ecological restoration route and just start now moving that needle ever more consciously mm-hmm. and we're all doing it it's a community thing yeah. yeah yeah you can't do it yourself there's no way yeah, yeah there's no way you know i realized that at some point since i started my business really I, I'm, I'm not even kidding you that i thought during my 17 18 19, like from from the age of 17 until my son was born i was trying to ascend reality i was trying to like turn my physical <laughs> yeah. body into light right like right. i spent like years, i am a light being i spent Let's just years upgrade. bro yeah. straight up like so like i don't want to be stuck in third dimension anymore bro. there's 13 <laughs> you like, know i can I mean? go up yeah. you know so like at that point i thought that i could achieve like higher consciousness by myself i thought that i can like achieve some state of like greater awareness of reality of physics of math of just like seeing everything with more information and if you take an ant by itself, it doesn't really do anything. It won't even like keep itself alive. It won't even feed itself or anything. But like you put a group of ants together and it creates, you know, complex colonies and does all these different buildings. You can even farm mushrooms and things like this. Yeah. So like I realized at a certain point I was just an ant by myself and that if I wanted to be that higher consciousness, that it would take working with a community of individuals that have already attained self-awareness because there's a lot of people that is just trying to survive has no idea who they are has no idea what time it is it is a A lot of people don't even know if they're dehydrated they don't know yes it's a mix and like there was there you know god bless or you know if god bless everybody you know i mean that's the way me and my son we say prayers every night i know what reality is like for people you know what i mean and like we 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 say our prayers to everybody because there's people out there that doesn't have Somebody sitting down with them saying prayers at night. There's people that doesn't have, you know, somebody that loves them every day. And, like, I have a lot of friends that grew up that way. And, like, they're learning life as it comes. And yeah. it's a lot. Like, being a human being is a lot. And, like, there's a lot that we had to grow up with as individuals that, like, you know, was born in the 80s into the 90s. And there's, like, so many distractions and, you know, so much information. And, like, you could literally just, like, be 18 years old and you're just like, whoa. How did I get here? And I know a lot of people just like that, that they can't even remember their childhood. There wasn't enough diversity in the information. It was so much, so much repetitive patterns, you know, Saturday morning cartoons, wake up every morning, go to school, you know? Yeah. We had new rituals that weren't intentional rituals, like passed down by our family or something that gives you that foundation and figuring out who you are and being able to navigate. But I think what's amazing you know because so many people can get buried in that too Mm -hmm. right for a lot of us you kind of poke your head up whatever it is 16 17 18 you think oh it's over like i was born into this i we don't have we can't do anything Mm -hmm. like we're already so far down the track and that's what is beautiful i think about your message 
and you know about working with mushrooms about working with microorganisms and all the work you do is it's like yeah there's a collective consciousness with other like-minded people decentralized we're not all going to be one borg hive mind Mm -hmm. but like connecting with other people building a collective consciousness that is kind of higher consciousness and then extending that to other organisms Mm -hmm. right that's the tip i feel like is happening more and more now and those people and this is something i've seen from doing all these different interviews everything and you've connected with thousands of people around all these people that have that cognizance of connecting consciousness with other organisms suddenly you're on this other level bro it's like the cordyceps are part of the community the chanterelles are part of the community right. the truffles I mean, yeah. are part of the spirulina bro it's like once you see that suddenly some of these things like some so many things click and mm-hmm. so many you start to move so much differently and you realize like okay we can change a lot of things actually pretty quickly yeah. man it goes like goku spirit bomb every time <laughs> that's what it yeah. is that's what that's what this all is like that's what mycosymbiotics is bro like I get by day to day from people that I know that buys my products. Like people, like not that I know that they buy my products, but like I met them some t- at some point. Right. Like for ten years, I've been everywhere across the U.S. to all the little niche little cutty mushroom events until they were popular, and I've been right. on them. Like you know what I mean? And like yeah. I've shaken these people's hands. Like for ten years, the people that was like the most into this, like the that people that dedicated their lives to being a crazy person, also that had to farm up on the hill, that knew about where the best place to forage was, that the people that cared about those things are the people that hired me to go teach in those different places. And I go there and they show me the best farmer's markets and the coolest springs. And those are the people that buy my products. Like I I can see it online and like, that's what keeps my family going. And like, that's what brings us in. You know what I mean? And it's just like, it's a really nice give and take through what we've done with MycoFest and through what we've done with our classes. We've been able to like provide a platform for other people to be able to learn about this, be able to build on it. You've seen all these mushroom festivals popping up across. Do you know how many people can con- have me consult with them on how to do that? Yeah. Straight up. I would imagine. Do you know how many people came them. to MycoFest yeah. and was like, yeah. I like this. How can I do this where I live? Right. And so like here we are now. And what this means is like there was an almost unbroken chain for like three months straight that if you were really about this life that you could have been at a mushroom festival to a mushroom festival to a mushroom yeah, festival yeah. and making your living. Yeah. Th- that didn't exist when I, when we started. That's a new ecology. That's a new ecology. That you helped put together. Yeah, you know what I mean? And it's like ecological system. Yeah. That's the community, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like before it was that, it was like people that would come to my events or people that would see me somewhere, they would be like, hey, come to my spot, come to my spot. And then I'd be like, hey, you come, you want to teach, you want to give a talk at my thing? like, Or like, hey, I see this opportunity. You know who's the perfect person for that? Bah, like boom, boom, boom. Like yeah. the more successful our community is the more successful your community is the more opportunities you have and like i i had the blessings of living near charles eisenstein whenever i was young wow he lived down the road from me i met him because i was pulling poison ivy out of his backyard i got a job in his backyard that's wild like doing landscaping yeah so like he's crazy smart yeah right so like he was telling everybody about gift economics when i was younger Mm -hmm. and he said in the gift economy the person that gives the most is the richest so (sighs) every time i have I immediately just push it away from me <laughs> and like yeah. it's put me in this position where like out of space for stuff to come in. Yeah, bro. Like I li- like me and my family live on people's graciousness straight up. Like people give us everything that we need to be alive. People let us stay in their places. People let us stay on their land. And until I build up enough wealth to get my space and do that for others, like that's just what it is. And like reinforces it. I need people to know that I'm living my best life luxuriously with decadent sustainable garments and my yeah. belly filled of like the best food in the land right and it's almost always free and it's almost yeah. always just like on the bless up and it's not unattainable yes because nature is abundant like people will, will see me pull these lot massive amounts of mushrooms out the woods and they're like oh like did you leave some all sustainability i'm like i covered one portion of the whole swath of this mountain. Yeah, do you know how much mycelium is under here? Like, yeah, like I see so, I see hundreds of thousands of pounds of rotten, high valuable mushrooms in the forest. Yeah. Every time I go out, I will see more not available than is than is available. Like yeah. nature is so abundant. All those spores are in the air all around you right now. And like it's taken care of. It, it yeah. blows my mind too because like as I've studied the ecology for the past 10 years and as I, I literally for three years, I've been scoping out 
all of the Matsutake habitat in the Northeast and Mid Atlantic of the United States. And there's like, it's isolated into small regions because of urbanization. Not, not just that, but many other mushrooms. Yeah. And it always blows my mind when I'm on the side of some parking lot because that's the only concentration of this one tree species that I can find anywhere, like next to some target or something. I'm like, wow, we've really been a terrible steward of the land and right. it still gives us so much. What if we like what cared we about this? Like, you know what I mean? Like, whoa. Like, yeah. yeah well, whoa. And that's what gives you so much hope. And, <laughs> and that's why I... You know, in talking about some of these concepts, it's easy to get really misanthropic mm-hmm. and be like, human beings are destroying everything. We're bad. It's like, no, 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 we're not bad. Yeah. We, we, we're going to remember what we're here to do and what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And actually, human beings are the only creations right now that can, that can consciously improve our environment, can understand our environment and improve it to make it function better, to be allies to all the other organisms mm-hmm. in the environment mm-hmm. consciously. Mm-hmm. That's a gift. And that's why we're here. Like that's for me when I realized that and it was a lot of listening to people like yourself, listening to other teachers talk about ecology, working with other organisms. You realize this is what we're here to do. Like my dad was a biology professor for 40 years. And so he was teaching me about that since I was a kid. And it's like seeing how much passion he had for that. For me, it just clicked. And it was like, this is what we're here to do. We're organism. We are a scientific instrument that I'm totally taking from you right now, mm-hmm. but our senses everything we are a scientific instrument designed to interpret this world and be able to work with this world that's what we're here to do and so we we haven't done that we've done this other thing we built our own thing because that's what we thought we could manage because we haven't gone deep enough into the other way or who knows how that happened right someone started (laughs) there's there's a great book there's a great book called ishmael for any listener i love it i love that book because it's about this guy who talks to a gorilla and the gorilla is the narrator telling like human history when we started Farming kind of was the point where we jumped into this other direction of being more detached from nature. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, yeah, we, we can kind of come back and remember and take everything we've learned. We don't have to get rid of technology. Straight up. We don't have to get rid of the systems we have. That's great stuff there. Like, yeah, we got, we got some great stuff. These microphones we're talking on are great. And we yeah. can take all this and just how can we be more ecologically minded? Mm-hmm. Oh, we can do interviews with people talking about ecology to influence someone else across the country to do what Will's been doing. And that starts to make those connections and you're, and you're living proof. Well, I don't want to wrap up the show because we have now gone like, like out beyond, like out into the universe. And now to bring it back <laughs> to kind of, again, what you're doing here in California, yeah. tell us, uh, well, I've got I so only many told questions. you the first thing I was doing here. I know. We talked about the documentary. There's so much to cover. So tell us about <laughs> the Matsutake pairing, the Cordy camp, what's going on here in Calistoga for any of the listeners here who are in Northern California. I want them to know about this. Tell us about those events. Right on. Yeah. So on Friday, we're doing Matsutake and Mary. So like that's an event uh, series that I developed three years ago. The first one, it was no Mary. It was just Matsutake. We did like a cook off. Um, I just wanted to celebrate it. I wanted to celebrate the abundance that we have and show people, you know, that we have this really valuable thing that they should care about. So the second year we did Matsu and Mary because it it, it aligns with Croptober. Um, so like all the cannabis farmers around the country time. is harvest yeah. time at the same time that the Matsutakis are out. So I'm just like, that is awesome. Let's celebrate both of them together. Um, so I was like, all right, Matsutaki and Mary, because we were going up to Maine and we would just go like crash at our homies hash farms and like use that as like home base to go pick mushrooms and like nerd out and stuff. So like, let's amplify all of us because like I value you guys. We're in the same community. How do I shine light on you? And we can all eat together. And the event is always amplified by their crowd that doesn't might not even know stuff about mushrooms. And then my crowd that might not know anything about hash. And then you get new hash consumers, you get new mushroom consumers, and it's a win-win on both sides. So, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we're going to be serving, like, four courses. We're going to be taking people out mushroom foraging. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll find some matsutake. Um, if not, we got plenty. But uh, uh, Ma- got- so matsutake and herb. Yeah. This is the pairing. Now, what does that mean, though? But so, like... like- yeah, like we'll, uh, we have a chef, uh, Juliet. Um, she's going to be uh, preparing the different courses. And we're like going through the coursework this week. And I'll be tasting this, the different food. And I'm like, all right, you know, this profile of this different hash is going to go well with this dish. Um, so we can say that all right, it's going to be this dish served with this hash. Um, and then we have puff code devices, which are like like vaporizer devices that you can like put it to a certain temperature. So it's like people aren't getting like blasted or anything. You know, what I mean, right. they're getting they're tasting it. So it's like a right. low temperature flavor rich kind of 
you know, puff, and then you could take your, your bite of food, and it just, like, like has an experience. We were talking about before how far, like, marijuana culture has come, <laughs> and this is the next level, like, pairings, tasting pairings. Yeah. Well, and Matsutake is just such a pungent, unique mushroom. You mm-hmm. know, one of the first, like, really epic forages I had was at David Aurora's in Mendocino. He hosts yearly this trip and he took us into his house and cooked matsutake over the fire and did a bunch of preparations and it is wild how unique that mushroom is and how many yeah. ways you can use it and there's a reason right mm-hmm. that people in japan it's they a billions it. of dollar industry oh man it's crazy like yeah. in the 80s people were in like the pacific northwest in canada were like eating good yeah. bro they were paying like yeah. up to 80 dollars a pound sometimes like it was right. crazy so like it, it, it's a beautiful thing and then and then uh saturday and sunday we're going to be doing our uh, cordy camp at the ranch over in calistoga so like this is the beginning of like setting up an event series um so we have the certified ranch certified is our sister company which i'll talk about a little bit but we have a ranch up in calistoga um that we've been working and turning to a permaculture campus uh for microsymbiotics and to be able to host different events and like really do a lot of our educational material from there you know there's there's three cows up there two donkeys about six goats uh, we have a uh, reishi uh, grow room set up right now, just filled up with Ganoderma. Um, and we have a mushroom lab there. Um, and we're working through our certified organic process for growing cordyceps up there. And this is you guys. This is like, us. This is you. Yeah, this is us. This is like the, the culmination of everything we were talking about, about building community, learning about systems, mm-hmm. turning away from society, but then figuring out how to build value and build community. 100%. Now you've got land the ultimate asset the ultimate thing everyone wants Mm -hmm. you've got land space Mm -hmm. to engage in this work yeah i mean i'm about to go i'm gonna be even going to spain in uh, february and then i'll be flying from spain to oregon back to back truffle classes like i'm gonna be taking truffle class uh um with a lab over in spain and they've been studying truffles like since truffle cultivation was truffle cultivation so like um i'm gonna go learn you know the the classic and all the new research that they have over there Plus my cro- microscopy, they're gonna teach me how to identify truffle fungus on the roots of plants, specific species of truffle fungus on the roots of plants. I want to translate that knowledge to be able to work with other ectomycorrhizals because there's people cultivating saffron milk caps. There's people cultivating a variety of different boletes and amanitas by inducing ectomycorrhizal. Uh, and so you're uh, just studying the hyphal thread where it's connecting with the root tissue, and that's yeah, it literally wraps around the root tissue, but right. like there, but. The tuber melanosporum fungus looks different than the tuber estivum fungus on the roots. And they're going to wow. teach me how to identify them, different species, by the fungus on the roots. And, like, I want to combine this with the knowledge that I got by taking the algal culturing techniques course at the Booth Bay Labs up in Big, uh, at the Bigelow Labs up in Booth Bay, Maine. They taught me about single cell isolation from, like, like wild water. Like, combining Isolating these... Isolating algae from... I can, yeah. Bro... They, they show me how to isolate a single cell. Like, I can go into any water source in the whole world. I can concentrate that water, and then I can look in it to see all the different organisms in it, find one that I want, and take it out of there. With, 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 with microscopy. With a microscope, my hand, a little bit of a glass, a tube that goes into my mouth to suck it out. <laughs> see, and that's what this – and I've talked with Matt Powers, and now I've talked with you. You turn me on to Matt Powers. <laughs> um, and it's amazing. It almost seems like there's no way it could be that analog – of like you're visually looking at things like he's doing all that soil oh. science with soil microscopy and you're looking at mycelium tips like everything we heard about <laughs> PCR and rapid like mass sequencing you think oh they're putting it in solution they're heating it up they're shaking it up they're <laughs> replicating that's the only way we're going to be able to cope and it's amazing how much of now so much is emerging with microscopy like no mm. no we can really do all this with our eye that's wild it's so wild so like yeah. After I took that algae class, I ended up getting this private tour of the Fairchild Botanical Gardens by the lead scientist of the uh, Million Orchids Project, and he showed me how he was pulling endophytic and ectomycorrhizal off of orchids. But I think they mostly have uh, endophytic connections. Um, well, they rely on them. Most orchid species can't exist, right? They need without their seeds the to be germinated with, with endophytes. And, but, yeah. but they're not classical mycorrhizals. They're classical saprophytes, like Ganoderma. That yes. get into that reach into their mycorrhizal capacity, bro. Everything yeah. is everything is not stand like this is nothing I, is static. Well, and see for any listener who does, like mycelium mushrooms, just to scale it back, have so many different capacities. They can mm-hmm. connect with other plant species, like we're talking about mycorrhizal. That's the big wood wide web in the forest we always hear about. Mm-hmm. Where they connect with trees and link those together, pass sugars, pass energy, pass messages, 
albeit selectively, they can be sap prophetic, which is what we're used to with the decay dead things. Mm -hmm. And in that, but I'm convinced and, and endophytes that live inside of plants and imbue certain properties. And then you can have whole combinations of mycelium living in plants with mycoviruses that imbue specific properties to the plant. <laughs> so there are all these relationships that mushrooms have with biology, but we always think, well, this species is specialized in this way of uh, connecting. So are they mycorrhizal? Are they saprophytic? We kind of separate them. But I'm so much now getting into what are the latent capacities? Like is mycelium kind of a code that can start operating it can kind of reactivate certain parts of its biology and say okay now we need to do this to survive bro and those latent capacities exist in there is it in every mycelium have certain ones selectively evolved to where like yeah we don't use it as a last resort but it's still there where these mushrooms like these organisms are just they're like a skeleton key for biology in a mm -hmm. lot of ways i i can't remember the exact quote but my buddy david augustiniak out in new mexico showed me the ecology of the Fomitopsis pinnacola in New Mexico is different than the Fomitopsis pinnacola in the Pacific Northwest. It's always wet in the Pacific Northwest. In the desert in New Mexico, it still lives there, but it lies dormant for long periods of time. It has a whole different lifestyle. I don't know. It's like a lot of like, I mean, you could be walking in the woods one day and see some mushroom that nobody ever saw before and nobody will ever see again. There's yeah. like such novel ecology to these things sometimes the individuals of certain species are more different than other species which i don't know how that's possible but someone told me that it's like you almost have to start looking at fungus on the individual basis dude every maitake every maitake tree i go to it's like looking at a different person yeah. it's like it's like if you have a bunch of goats not all the goats are the same even though right. they came from the same mom even though they're the same breed and that's the thing that makes everything different you know what i mean like this is like like, I was just at the um, tar pits. I was at the La Brea, La Brea pits. tar pits. Yeah, with my, I took my family there, and they have this big wall of wolf head skulls. And it's all the same species of wolf. It's all the dire wolf. But everyone is a little nuanced, and it's just like trying at all these different, you know. Which is nice, because if our purpose here is to examine biology, we've got the work of infinite lifetimes. Because it's always changing. Well, for anyone who's listening and wants to hear more about this, I think we're going to jump. I would love to jump into a second hour to talk more about the events, mm -hmm. a little more about cordyceps, where you are today. Mm -hmm. For any listeners, just to tease it, cordyceps are the zombie fungus that take over insects. William P. D. Brown was one of the people that popularized the idea in America of being able to cultivate them, which has spawned whole industries unto itself. Uh, where can people learn more about you, though? Share, you know, where should people go to learn more about the events? Microsymbiotics.com. Everything's there. Has all of our products, all of our events, everything like that. More information is always there. Love it. Yep. Well, William, thank you for coming on the Mushroom Hour. Right on. Bless. Bless.